uh, everyone who's speaking at the Conj, uh, you're about to find out what happens if you don't submit any biographical information to me before I introduce you. Uh, <laughs> this is David McNeil. He's going to uh, be talking about uh, a couple of uh, areas of closure that are particularly near and dear to my heart. Uh, the first one is I love in his abstract where he talks about large-scale parallel in process. I think one of the things that happens around the industry is that uh, we do good things, but we punt on what's possible in the local process. So I, I really think that the vision of what you can do in a single process is particularly important. And so I'm looking forward to this story. And yet, I cannot help noticing that uh, the words fork join also appear uh, in the abstract. And it seems to me that a year ago, we were watching a David talk to us about fork join. And here we are, a year later, watching a different David talk to us about fork join. And yet, the fairly straightforward couple of hundred lines of code that it would take to actually have a cool fork join story integrated into Clojure for everybody's benefit has not been stepped up and delivered by anyone. So I'm going to say right now that Revlytics has graciously agreed, uh, following the conj, <laughs> that they are going to step up and, and do that work to push the fork join support that he's going to talk about here today into the end zone and make it something that's consumable by everyone from Clojure. So thank you very much, David. Well, thank you, Stu. Um, yeah, I think you'll see this is actually a bit different than what David talked about last year, but we can still talk about it. Um, yeah, so I'm David McNeil. I've had the privilege of working at Revolytics for the last two years as a full-time Clojure developer. During that time, we have, oops, one second. During that time, we've built a database federation product, and uh, we continue to build a database federation product uh, in Clojure. Uh, really, it does two main functions. The first is query translation, and the second is database federation. So on the query translation side, we'll take in a semantic query, so a Sparkle query, and translate that into a set of equivalent SQL queries on a data source. On the database federation side, again, we'll take in a single logical query, and we'll break that up into a set of uh, physical database queries that need to be run on many database sources. So in both of these problems, the pattern is a single query comes in at the top, and then many queries need to be run against underlying databases. All those queries produce result sets, which we process as parallel data streams, and then we have to do additional query processing on top of those to kind of fill in the gaps of what a database would be doing to present that as a single logical result set to the end user. So this is the core problem I'm here to talk about today, is how we have tried to cast that problem and our solution to it in a way that takes, um, that really leverages closure well and fits in well with closure. So this is, um, this is all running uh, production code that we've shipped. So uh, what you'll see is the trade-offs that we've made between the amount of time we can spend on design and, of course, the pragmatic pressures of shipping. So by no means do we present it as it's the paragon and we're done, but rather uh, we, we think we've done some things well. We think there's room to, to push further and, and apply more design to this. So the kind of operations that we need to do on these parallel data streams, they should look very familiar to you if you're familiar with closure sequence operations or even if you're familiar with what database queries do. It's kind of the, what, what are to me somewhat universal data stream processing operations. We have other requirements besides the basic processing. There's kind of these non-functional requirements. Uh, we want to do things like have good exception handling. We want to make sure that as we're processing very large streams that are too large to fit into memory, that we don't blow the heap. We also want this kind of thing that you get from databases sometimes, which is a visible workings aspect. So you can go in and you can see what processing is running. And uh, you can see how much data is flowing through different nodes in the processing. You can have user-initiated or system-initiated uh, cancellations of those things. So it's really kind of like building a database engine in Clojure, except where the sources of the data, rather than being in like indexed files controlled by the database, the sources of the data are themselves data streams coming in from underlying databases. So, of course, data processing is nothing new, and we do stand on the shoulders of giants. So we have these massive pieces of great technology out there that are, are available at our fingertips to be used, and the question is, how do we effectively leverage those? 
not only do we, how do we effectively leverage them to do good work, but how do we end up with a design such that we don't like anger the giants too much, right? They're not too dissatisfied with what we have done. So we kind of feel that pressure and uh, that's part of what I'll talk through today. And really this, the story starts here, I'll start with uh, the C Unix world, which is obviously so much a part of our daily lives. And in particular, I like this uh, memo, which is out online. It's from one of Dennis Ritchie's colleagues, dated 1964. It looks typewritten, I guess it must be typewritten. And uh, he talks about having a way of coupling programs like garden hoses. And so it's, it's great to me to think that, that long ago we have someone expressing the core idea of what we're actually trying to build today. So here's an example of a, a Unix pipe invocation that any of us might write and use on a regular basis. And I'm gonna walk through this piece by piece because as it turns out, if you understand well how Unix pipes work, then you can transfer much of that understanding to understanding the library that we've built for data processing. So I'll take a tour of the parts here. Uh, obviously you have processes, so when you invoke a command like this, you're um, allowing like this curl and set and all these commands to be run in parallel. Each of them have their own address space, they can be threaded, and each of them has a very uh, narrow, well-defined way of communicating with its upstream and downstream partners. Of course they communicate via pipes, which are these asynchronous communication channels between the processes. And these pipes can carry this end of file indicator. And this is kind of a pointer to one of the three main things that a process can do in terms of its downstream partner. It can produce data, it can produce an error, or it can indicate that there will be no more data forthcoming. I'm done, Clo this stream is closed. So at the bottom you have these processes and pipes, and on top of it you have this nice compact syntax to invoke it. Into that syntax, of course, you can pour the various operators. There's a wide library of existing uh, predefined operators and you can write your own. All this is run finally in this implicit execution environment that knows how to run processes and tie them together with pipes. So I'm gonna like, hopefully take what you know about this and now when I start talking about our library, you can kind of bring some of that understanding with you. So what we have built is a library that allows us to define data structures which represent which represent pipes for communicating between processes and nodes for representing processing of the data that flows through those pipes. This for us, just like with the Unix model, this is kind of a low level mechanism. And the question is what kind of syntax do we pour on top of that? So think of a syntax like the command line, the Unix pipe command line that you'd want to invoke. And of course, as you can see from the picture here and as I've described it, what we're really building are trees, not simple straight pipes. So we, the, the input on the left here would correspond to two data streams coming in. We do some kind of processing and produce a final single stream out. So we need to represent a tree. We're in a closure. We can obviously look to another uh, uh, pioneer of our industry and we can choose S expressions as our means, as our syntax for representing these computations that we want to do. So this is a peek at what I'm gonna talk about. This is a stream processing expression using our our operators, so it's kind of like our DSL for stream processing. Um, all of our stream operators, they end with this plus, so you can see through there how the stream flows through uh, this expression. So what we've built is a compiler that will take an expression, a stream processing expression of that form, and compile it down and produce this structure of nodes and pipes, which is the thing that's actually run. And that's run on a fork join pool. So that's where the fork join comes in. So this now shows you all those same elements that I showed in the Unix pipe invocation. I have a very brief demo to give you a feel for what this might look like in practice. Uh, for the demo, I'm gonna use the example of word count. So this right now is just a plain closure sequence expression. Our library is not involved with this at all. Uh, at the bottom, we have strings coming in and we're gonna do a map and reduce on top of that. So we're gonna do a map which will split each string into its constituent words. We're gonna count those up, and then the reduce will sum all those up. So this will give us a total count of how many words appear in the input set. So this is four, of course. Uh, slightly more impressive, so here's the text of War and Peace. I can do that, and there's 580,000. So this now is the equivalent in our stream processing language. 
So I've built this expression on the right. It's very similar to uh, what we were just looking at. I have the data stream coming in, the strings coming in from that file. I'm going to turn that into a stream using one of our operators. And this thousand, that will indicate uh, how to chunk that. So it'll group it into chunks of a thousand for processing. And that chunking is really mostly invisible to the parts above it, but it's kind of important to get the uh, performance characteristics that you want. So this uh, map invocation is, is that still readable? This is very similar to the plain closure version, using the same split, the same count. It's just the operator that we use is our pmap plus operator, which implies, the p implies that it will be implemented in a parallel fashion. Similarly, the reduce is very similar to the closure version, except um, if, you're, if you notice there's an extra operator out here, which I can talk more about that later, but basically it's, it's very similar to the closure expression. So I build this up as just a data structure, so it's just a list by putting the tick in front of it, and then I can pass it to this exec stream function. And what that will do is that will go out and create a fork join task pool, register this process, this stream expression with it to be processed, and return the result. So you see it returns the same value that the, the regular closure expression returned. Um, you'll notice it comes out as a sequence. So the way our stream expressions work is even if you do this reduction, everything that's flowing through the expression is treated as a stream. So it looks very similar to the closure expression, but what's happening under the covers is actually much different. And to kind of give you a glimpse into that, I have an example here where um, I made a few changes to the expression. I'm just going to take the first 10 lines, and I replace these uh, the mathematical operators with just some demo functions. And what they do is they keep track of the full history of the number. So every time you do an addition, it keeps track of what numbers were added, and not only that, but what thread was doing the work. So here you can kind of see the history of, in this case, the number 64, and you can see all the threads that were involved with producing that number. So this is just kind of my token little indicator to you that uh, it actually is doing this whole parallel processing thing under the covers. So that's the high level view of what we're doing. Now I'm gonna start from the bottom up and try to describe to you how we've actually built this. So we have pipes at the bottom. The idea is you have a producer thread and a consumer thread that you're asynchronously passing data between. Uh, these are the operations we've defined on our pipes. So on the producer side, you can enqueue data, you can close the pipe, and you can signal an error. That should sound very familiar to what I described on the Unix side. And of course, you can get those out on the, on the consumer side. Pipes are made to be multi-threaded, so you can have many producers and many consumers, and the pipe will guarantee that each item gets delivered once. We also have this ability to register a callback on a pipe. And the way that works is anytime an item is enqueued on a pipe, uh, the calling thread will run the callback function before it returns. And I'll show how that's used uh, later on in the talk. So we capture all this as a protocol, so that gives us our point of abstraction. Uh, this is one area that was very clear preparing for the presentation that we need more design work applied. Because obviously in closure style, it's kind of offensive to have like all these different concerns grouped into one interface, if you will. So you can easily see breaking out the enqueuing and the dequeuing. And looking at Stuart Sierra's work, I think the analogy would be to break it down even further to have the idea of, you know, can this be closed or can this be an error? Maybe it's very fine-grained interfaces. But behind that abstraction, we can build different implementations underneath. So we can make a multiplexer that looks like two separate input pipes from the consumer or producer perspective, but it's actually going to a single output pipe. Uh, conversely, we can make a T where a producer writes one item and it actually goes to two separate destination threads. So that was pipes. The other key piece is the nodes. So a node is analogous to a Unix process. It has an input pipe and an output pipe. Its job is to read from the input, do some processing, write to the output. If you look at the fields inside of a pipe, they act, or inside of a node, they have their pipes. They also have their task function, which is what they're supposed to run. That's the, the operation they have to do on the, the input data. Uh, we have a place to keep state. So if you think about like a reduce node, um, you can think about the reduction being stored in this state. And then we have a concurrency indicator. So if you've written a node to be single threaded, you can set a concurrency of one. Otherwise, you have a concurrency of n, and multiple threads could be running on a, a node at a given time. So to think about the threads then, we have the original producer and the final consumer, but then in the middle, we can have multiple threads running on each node. 
just like closure sequences, data is passed not single values, but nodes pass chunks of data on the pipes. So if our data items are maps, we're actually passing sequences of maps as the data items through the pipes. So we take all these primitive parts, the pipes and the nodes and the various pipe fittings I described, those muxes and Ts, and we can wire them up into this overall processing tree to describe the processing we need to do. So you just think about all the threading action. There's primitive parts that you put together, but you can build very complex, uh, highly concurrent parallel computations. You can describe them uh, with these primitives. From an external perspective, kind of bringing it back to the application I talked about, if you take one of these processing trees, the way to think of it is each pipe would be connected to, uh, say, a database query and its result set. So there'd be four database queries here, each one wired to an input pipe. And the person who submitted the query, they'd be waiting for that final result on the output pipe. So a question that comes up with libraries like this is trying to get to the bottom of, is the data being pushed or is it being pulled? The way I'm drawing these pictures, it's clear the overall flow of the data is from left to right. Uh, but then within each piece, there's kind of pushing and pulling happening. So pipes, they expect the producer to push the data into them, and then similarly, they expect an active consumer who's pulling the data out. Nodes are the opposite. So nodes expect to be active kind of on both sides. They expect to pull their data from input and push it to the output. So kind of at a micro level, if you think of the overall tree, there's pushing and pulling being hap happening throughout that processing tree. So I've talked about the threads running on the nodes, but I haven't described how we do that. So here's my shot at that. Um, I'm only concerned with the threads that need to run the processing nodes, so I'm not concerned with the producer threads or the final consumer thread. I'm only concerned with how do I schedule threads to run the task node functions. And here, one of our main design goals was to treat these worker threads as a scarce resource, so we don't want to waste them. We don't want them to be wasted waiting for input from a producer we don't want to waste them polling various inputs. So we want it to be asynchronous. As data arrives, we want tasks to be triggered to run on the thread pool. So this is where the pipe callback comes in. When pipes are wired up to nodes, the node will register a callback on the pipe. So when a producer thread enqueues into the pipe, it'll automatically run the callback. And what the callback does is create a task which will be asynchronously scheduled in the thread pool. So it doesn't do the work of the node, it just creates this little task which tells the thread pool, hey, you need to do something on this pipe. The other way that tasks get generated is the task function that we really put inside of that task not only has the task function of the node, but it has extra wrappings around it. So um, you can see here what it does is it'll run the task function on an item and queue the results of that into the output pipe, but then it'll go on and try to create another task. So tasks can be created not only when data arrives on a pipe, but also as tasks complete. And it's not obvious, but that's actually sufficient to keep the whole machine running. So when data comes in, you kick off work, and as you finish work, you kick off new work, and it just keeps everything running. Of course, we don't just create those tasks willy-nilly. We create them under certain constraints. So if there is no data on the input pipe, we don't create a task. And we don't create more than the concurrency node, or the concurrency of the node indicates is allowed. So then the net effect of this is as data is flowing through the input pipe, the original input pipes, and then all these intermediate pipes, you're kind of kicking off all these tasks every time either a data item arrives or a task completes. And those all get scheduled down onto the thread pool. The thread pool we're using is uh, Java fork join. This is, you know, I view it as another you know, big piece of very well-crafted, carefully designed um, code that we can just leverage by dropping in. Uh, kind of the 10 second version is it's a thread pool that has been carefully designed to avoid uh, context switching when not necessary and to avoid contention on the work queues. So now moving up a level, I think of this black box here as a processor. So a processor has a worker thread pool, and it has a bunch of process trees that it's supposed to be running. So externally, if you wanted to make one of these trees, you could make a, a S expression, a list that, had, that described what you needed, go to a processor and say, here, you know, I registered this, please run it. One of 
One of the things I said we wanted to do was be able to handle very large streams that don't fit into memory. So we have all these process trees running, we have all these pipes. All those pipes are accumulating on the heap. We're using up heap space for all those. And the obvious question is, what happens when you run out of heap? So I have a whole other sub-presentation for this, but the one slide version is we've created buffered pipes. So Java makes it really easy to uh, do memory mapped, uh, memory mapped files. And uh, so we've created a, a pipe implementation that leverages those. So we detect when we're low on memory, and at that point we swap in buffered pipes, and those buffered pipes will, uh, they're able to write the data out to disk, so you can really just dramatically expand your storage. And then once we're back to a, um, out of the low memory condition, we can swap back to using regular pipes. And this actually doesn't happen on the pipe level. We actually have the idea of a composite pipe. So you can have a pipe made up of subpipes, so parts of them can be buffered and parts not, depending on how your memory conditions are. I wanted good exception handling, so when a thread anywhere down in this process tree throws an exception, we have the code in place to, to percolate that all the way up and out as the final result. Similarly, we have our hooks in all these pieces of the processing tree. So either on a user-initiated basis or a system-initiated basis, we can track down all the parts and, and shut them all down when necessary. So that's the pipe and node, like the bottommost layer. Now I'm moving up to talk more about this, uh, the way we express these stream expressions. The way I think of what we've built is that a stream expression is this core tree where the skeleton is our stream operators, and then you hang off of that uh, in specific holes, closure expressions. So showing the same thing a little bit more graphically, I think of this tree of, of our stream operators with just leaves in there of closure expressions. And the reason this is important is because that plays into how we end up compiling that. So we don't do general code walking of the expression, we expect the core expression to be in our operators. So the way the compiler works is it starts from the bottom up and it transforms this expression into equivalent pipe, uh, an equivalent pipe node structure. It's not just one-to-one -one operator, but like each operator doesn't become a node, but rather the compiler looks for sequences of operators that are compatible that can be run in a node together. So they have compatible concurrency limitations, they, um, they don't use the state in different ways, and uh, it takes into account how the, the streams are being joined together. So going through the operators we provide, they uh, mirror the closure sequence operators. So these do what you would expect, and then we have parallel versions of these. Uh, again, we have parallels to closure operators to take parts of a stream. We have an additional one, which I'm not aware of in closure. It's a way to just combine two streams together. That's the MUX. And then the, the let operators, those really come into play with uh, the need to operate on multiple streams of data in an expression. So here's an example. Uh, in this example, you can see, if you look closely, there's actually two data streams flowing through here. In the top, in the binding for the let, we have uh, one source data, which has this hello and a simple test. So what this will do is it, it runs that stream expression to completion to get a final reduction value, and it binds that to the, the symbol word count. And now there's a second stream being processed in the body of the let, so we're able to use the result of processing the first tree in the context of processing the second tree. So you can think of this is a, a node in our S expression where two streams came together. We have another operator which uh, is similar but different. It's this let stream. And what this does is um, if you look at the main body down there, we reference this, this symbol tuples in two places. So let stream allows you to assign a name to a sub expression and use that in many places in your main body. So this again is a way of having multiple input streams, which here are just copies of the same stream, but you're processing them as two separate inputs to the body of the, of the let. So our chunkiness of our streams, uh, we allow that to leak through in a few places so that you can actually do operations at the chunk level if that's appropriate for what you're doing. So you can map over chunks at a time, reduce over chunks. Um, a lot of times the order of data 
in these is important. So if you have data coming in on a stream and you want to preserve that order, you can call a number operator on it and it will number all those chunks. You can then send it through some parallel processing that scrambles the order, and then you can apply, apply the reorder operator after that, and it'll put it back into the original order that it was in before the parallel operation. The rechunk operator, uh, you might have operators, operations that make chunks really small, which hurts your efficiency. So if you can put, our compiler can look at that and put in a rechunk operator where needed to uh, get back up to full size chunks. Then finally, we have a couple of operators that are really just used by our compiler. And uh, the node operator, when the compiler runs, it'll make decisions about which parts of the expression should be uh, grouped together into a node. And we actually annotate the stream expression with those. Uh, so here we decided to put one above the pReduce and then another one above the map above that. So we capture that in the expression, expression so it's available for downstream use. You don't have to recalculate it. And it's helpful for debugging. Another node that our compiler adds, it's really just for debugging, is this number uh, operator. And this is really just like line numbers. We number the expressions in the tree so that as we're looking at debug output and as we're looking at kind of the names of various pipes that make up these trees, uh, we can have a roadmap that correlates those back to places in the original stream expression. So just like with Unix, pipes, you have built-in operators and you can add your own. You can write macros. So here, say we're going to be doing a lot of this word counting and we want to parameterize it by the regular expression that you want to provide. Um, this is just a plain closure macro. Uh, our, our stream expressions are just lists, so you can use you know, whatever closure mechanisms exist to produce those, whether it's functions or macros. Um, this does the obvious thing. Uh, so here I changed the regular expression to be an underscore and it counted up four words based on underscore as the split between words. If you call macro expand on that, it just does what you'd expect. It expands the macro out to the, the core operators um, that we've defined. So yeah, for me, this just brings a smile to my face. Uh, it's a very satisfying way to cast the problem and to build the solution to it. Um, coming from a team where we've solved this problem in the straight Java space, uh, you know, we can attest to this is a much more pleasant way to go about solving this problem. And um, yeah, it's good. So digging in in a more detail into how the compiling works. So I've shown this compiler, which is the, the path on the left I'm showing here. You take a stream expression you convert that into this node pipe structure. So that implies a certain interpretation of what those operators mean. So we have a compiler that knows what those operators mean. We have another implementation that understand, or that gives a different meaning to those operators and will convert a stream expression into a closure sequence expression. This is useful for debugging because it takes all of our uh, execution stuff out of the picture, but it also turns out to be very useful for the compiler itself. So the compiler, it's producing a node pipe tree that corresponds to the stream expression. But if you think about what the task node needs to do inside of each node, what the task function needs to do, at the time the task function runs, it's running over a chunk from the stream. So at that point, the input data to the task function is just a sequence. So what we do is we convert the stream operators to their closure equivalents, and that's what goes inside of the node. So at the bottom, when it actually runs, it's really just running closure sequence operations. So that wasn't at all obvious to us when we set out on this, but I thought it was a pretty neat result as far as how it, how it ended up being realized. So we've gone back and forth with different ways to implement our compiler. This is the way it is right now, so I'll talk about it first. We have a zipper which knows how to walk through the S expression. And then we have a multi-method that knows how to compile each node. Uh, if you haven't seen zippers, it's, I think of it as just kind of a functional trick to uh, deal with an immutable tree uh, when you want to mutate it. So our compile multi-method, uh, it expects to be given a list. So it dispatches on the, the first value in that list. So we have a PMAP 
and a P reduce, you know, each of these symbols we have implementations uh, for. They destructure their arguments that they expect. They produce whatever they're supposed to, to do. And I kind of give you a hint at the bottom here of what the code looks like. We make this expression zipper that'll zip through the expression and call compile on each node. So that's a zipper multi-method implementation. We've also uh, gone back and forth with a, an implementation based on closure eval. So we have a zipper that knows how to walk the tree, but of course closure knows how to walk S expressions. So we have alternate implementations of these where we've implemented all of our operators as either functions or macros. So there, rather than us zipping through the tree, you just call eval on it. The, eval the closure evaluator walks through the tree and invokes our functions at the right point. Um, just speaking for myself personally, not necessarily the team, we've had, the zipper version is easier to, to deal with. Um, it could be a failing on my part because, I mean, bottom line, macros are hard. So the compiling we're trying to do is fairly challenging work. And to add into that the mix of having to deal with understanding, you know, the, the, uh, the read time and how things are being evaluated and, you know, getting all your squiggles and ticks just right. It's just, it adds up. So we go back and forth between this. I personally go back and forth between this. Uh, I can go back and look at the, the eval-based versions, and I say, ah, it looks pretty easy. But I forget how hard I fought for each one of those uh, mysterious symbols. So I don't know. For what it's worth, that's what we've done. Um, kind of a pragmatic approach. We've wanted to, to follow the LISP philosophy and the closure philosophy. But at the same time, um, you know, we have to write code that we're comfortable with and that, that we feel like we can maintain and, and push forward. So that's what we've done. So kind of in summary, this is how uh, we've approached our DSL. Uh, we express it as S expressions, and for the most part, we pass it around as data. So we'll, we can pass those around. We can do optimizations on those to try to make more efficient or just simpler queries. Uh, as you may have noticed, we use unqualified symbols for our stream operators in these expressions. That, again, is a result of the fact that we look at these a lot, and we want to see a nice trim version, like someone would write, not like the expanded version, like you would get if you, um, if you called, uh, if you let the macro, if, if all the symbols were expanded to be namespace qualified. So because we have this very well-defined path of the skeleton of this tree is our operators, we avoid general code walking, and we allow users to write macros to, uh, to add their own operations into that. So the thing that they can't do is like where this PNAP plus is, you can't just put a function in there. You can't say, you know, if it's evening, go to this database, and if it's morning, go to this database. We haven't had any drivers for that, but if we did have that sort of need, then that seems to me like an argument for the eval-based version of, our, of the compiler, because now, obviously, eval would know how, how to run that. So something that we've done that I haven't necessarily seen other folks doing is we have multiple kind of compilers, if you will, that give different meanings to these operators. So I'm really actually curious to hear feedback from folks on that. Um, so like, like I showed, we have a version that creates pipe node structures. We have another version that converts them to closure, uh, just plain closure sequence equivalents. And with some of our other libraries, we have things that converts them to like maybe a, a record tree structure. So we end up having these operators, but then we pour in different meanings for those so that when you kind of evaluate it, you get different outputs depending on your context. So then to bring it back together to how do we actually use this in our applications, we're basically a database. So we bring in, we have queries come in at the top, we parse those, we uh, create a representation of the plans actually using closure of records. We perform, um, you can think of kind of doing refactorings on that or optimizations to change the shape of that query without changing the meaning. We look for like dead parts of it, we look for duplicated parts, all that sort of thing. So we can do all that up at the query plan level. And then we convert that query plan into a stream expression representation, which of course gets turned into this pipe node tree and gets run. And the way I like to think of what we do is we take a query in at the top, and then our code will write a program which will satisfy that query, and then we run that program on the fly. So again, for me, it's a very satisfying way to, to think about the, pro the problem, and it turns out to be really powerful. So what else do we have to look at? Uh, we're in the process right now of adding 
several operators that are specific to tuple operations. So everything that I showed so far is, um, it deals, I mean, it doesn't care what the data type is. Um, it could be strings, it could be maps, whatever. Uh, but obviously we deal a lot with tuples, so we're adding in these extra operators uh, that do the things that you would do in a, a query, like projecting and joining and computing aggregates. So we're following the same pattern that we followed for the stream expression DSL for this. We kind of, we see it as layering another DSL on top of that that's all about the tuple operations. Another item that we see like, down the road is to run these processing trees in a distributed fashion. So the way I think of this right now is we would break the processing tree up into parts. We would farm out those parts to different processes and then provide a pipe implementation to tie the processes together. So this is actually a pretty active area. There's a lot of real interesting links like uh, Stuart Sierra's Click, uh, Nathan Marcy's Storm. It's kind of a totally different take on this problem. Uh, Zach Tellman's Lamina, we actually started with that uh, and ended up kind of our pressures were different than his, I guess, so we ended up splitting off and doing our own thing. But uh, there's lots of very interesting libraries out there to take a look at. And um, like I say, we're shipping products, so if you want to check out our products, here they are. Uh, along that lines, Revolytics, off and on through the years, we've been hiring, and I would say uh, we've got a good team, we're solving hard problems, I think we're doing good work, and uh, we're using Clojure, so you can't beat that. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Closure Conj folks, for having me. And thank you, Rich, for Closure. It's good stuff. Um, that's it. So questions? <laughs> Couple minutes for questions, Chris? Or yeah. OK, anything? Yeah. Can you comment on uh, performance? Yeah, uh, I'd love to. <laughs> no, that's something we need to do. Um, as far as I'm concerned, we have the skeleton of the system up, and now there's you know many man months of tuning, of optimizing, of just gathering heuristics of how to effectively use this piece. I don't have that data. Yes. So uh, the fork joint implementation is definitely oriented around uh, computational power. Okay, that's interesting. So the question is, fork join is mainly about uh, parallelizing, parallelizing computation, not I.O. It actually comes back to one of our key design constraints, if I can find the slide. And that is, uh, the way we use that worker thread pool is we really isolate it from the I.O. So we don't do any of the I.O. Um, in, the, in the fork join pool uh, itself. So here, uh, we only use the fork joint tool for the processing of the node functions, and it's asynchronously triggered after the data has arrived. So we specifically didn't want to tie up any of those fork joint threads waiting, blocking for uh, sources. Does that answer your question? Yep. Yep. Yes? Uh, you said that the, the nodes have multiple threads. Correct. Is that the question? Yeah, are they closed if they are? If they are, how do you guarantee to switch out? Okay, so um, I'll try to answer that. So the question is, if we have multiple threads running in a node, are they just clones of each other, or how do we coordinate them? Yes. Right. So uh, the, kind of come back to this picture, we don't really allocate threads to a node, but rather each node, we kick off these tasks, which get scheduled in the fork join pool. So you can think of those tasks as really lightweight threads, which I think is a useful way to think of it. So then you can think of our processing nodes as there's many tasks running in them, which make them really close to Unix processes. Now you have state, which is like their memory address space, and you have many little threads running in them. But we don't assign a thread to a node in any sense, it's just running a task, so the, thread, the worker threads will periodically go through different nodes. And yeah, the, um, the underlying nodes that we write, they have to be carefully constructed so that those, the state is accessed in a safe manner. Right? So we, we do that work once, kind of in those base operators, the mapping and the reducing, they all, not mapping, but the ones that use state, use state in a safe way. And we get that implemented once, and then we can just build on top of that. We can write a stream expression 
that just leverages all that without having to, to think about the detailed concurrency requirements. Yes? Um, you had mentioned that uh, you track exceptions within the, the, the entire tree and that if a node throws an exception, it, it propagated up and out. Um, do you mean by that that it stops the computation at that point? Yes. Or it does? Yes. Is there a way that, that we, are there options to construct a processing graph that is resilient to that? I mean, I do think the classic example because you just lose a certain portion of the overall computation. That's the whole thing. Right. That's not part of what we do, but there's no reason you couldn't <coughs> write a task node function yourself that caught exceptions and handled them in some way. Uh, right. But we yeah. don't have anything built in. Yeah, typically, in the yeah. common do, you don't you don't expect the problem to occur, but you don't want to lose the remainder of the computation. I see. Yeah. No, we don't have a model that allows that. Yeah, so, thanks. Yep, thank you.